retirement investing utilizing 401k and IRAs. Hello, my name is Edwin Epperson. I am with The Sophisticated Investor, and we are helping investors like yourself build, protect, and preserve your family's generational wealth. Today's topics of learning, we're going to be discussing the laws that cover uh, retirement account investing, uh, what you can and cannot do. We're going to cover over how you can have more control over your retirement accounts. And we will be giving some examples specific to contribution and the different ways that you can maximize your contribution to each of the primary investment vehicles. So let's start covering the laws of retirement investing. So let's all agree that they they need to be separate entities, meaning you individually, your IRA, individual retirement account, and your 401k, which is typically a company-sponsored plan. Those are three separate entities viewed by the IRS. Uh, therefore, there are specific guidelines and rules for how each one of these entities can invest for retirement. So let's go over one of the requirements is there must be a third party administrator in place for an IRA or a 401k. For IRAs, these are typically called custodians. And for 401ks, these are typically called a trustee or a plan sponsor. Also, the third party must be separate from the individual. So in the previous slide, you had your individual, the IRA, and your 401k. The individual cannot actually be in charge uh, or have the custodian or plan sponsor or trustee roles in the IRA or the 401k. So what we're going to cover is the typical setup, which many of you may see right now as you are investing for retirement. So first we're going to cover the IRA. So we have the owner, the investor, that is you, you own the IRA, and then you are contributing every month to your IRA. There are maximums and we'll cover those in a minute. And then the IRA typically has stock market options. So the reason this is, is because your IRA actually has a custodian. Now these custodians are normally large brokerage firms that many of you are familiar with. Uh, we'll go over some of those later, but these custodians actually uh, manage or they are the custodian of your IRA, even though you're the owner. And then they say, hey, here's our options for you to invest. Uh, most of the options in many, many cases are tied to the stock market. So your custodian will be offering you uh, different types of annuities or insurances or mutual funds or bonds or some of their own structured products, if you will. And so whenever there's an opportunity that you want to direct your investments to buy some of these options, you'll communicate that with your custodian and then they will inspect the investment. Now, the inspection or the vetting, if you will, is not for the profitability or the safety or assuredness of that investment. It's simply to make sure that the investment that you are directing your IRA to purchase meets all the guidelines for ERISA. So we'll go over that in a minute, but this is the typical structure. And then the custodian will then invest or purchase the stocks uh, whatever those options are that you've uh, told them to. Let's go over the 401k because this is a little bit more in, in, in a little bit more um, moving pieces involved. Okay, so in many cases, uh, you as an employee, you are uh, an employee of your employer, and your employer may offer you a 401k, which is a type of retirement account. Now inside that 401k, again, just like the IRA, there's gonna be options that you can invest in. Now those options are determined and crafted by the 401k plan sponsor, okay? So there's a little bit extra uh, roles that you need to be aware of here. So the 401k plan sponsor, uh, and we'll go over that in a minute, is the company or typically a brokerage firm that creates the plan for your employer and then within that plan, they have the options, which we see here as A, B, or C, okay? Now, the owner, unlike the IRA, the owner of the 401k is not the investor or the employee. It is actually the company, uh, is the owner. So what does this look like? Let's, let's try to wrap our minds how this plays out in the real world. So in the real world, 
let's say UPS, they are the owner of the 401k, they're the company. So the company provides a 401k for its employees to invest in. The plan sponsor for UPS is the Hartford. Now they have a lot of different options within their 401k, there's different tiers, a lot of different things going on here. But at the end of the day, the Hartford is the plan sponsor for UPS. And so the Hartford creates these mutual funds, these structured products that UPS's employees can invest in. So what does the flow of money look like? Well, you are an employee, you're investing into your 401k and the owner is communicating with the plan sponsor, this is what we're going to invest in. Now, some owners will give the employee or yourself the investor to make the decision yourself, but in some older versions, uh, the owner is the one that's actually making the decision. You will see those typically in like pension plans or some other older version of the 401k. Now, a lot of owners have offset or offloaded the responsibility to choose the investments onto the employee. Either way, either the owner or the employee communicates with the plan sponsor. This is what I'd like to invest in. And then the plan sponsor starts to invest according to either the owner or the employee, whatever they're investing in. Okay. So Again, this is how it traditionally works. And if any of you are employed by an employer that has a 401k, this is more than likely what's happening. So what are the tax structures? Well, there are typically two tax structures within investment, uh, your investment accounts. One is called the traditional tax structure, okay? So the traditional investment account uh, you defer paying taxes today based on your current tax bracket, but when you begin to withdraw or get disbursements from your retirement plan, you will then pay taxes on your future or whatever your uh, tax rate would be at the time of disbursement. So what we normally see is people that invest into their IRAs or their 401k and it's set up as a traditional invest or retirement account. That retirement account is normally used by people that have a high tax bracket today and they are trying to reduce their taxable income so it reduces their overall tax liability. So that is a great structure for those who make a lot today and they are trying to shelter more of their income. If they can maximize their contributions inside a traditional retirement account, it can reduce their taxable uh, liability today. Now, the other tax structure is called the Roth IRA or the Roth component. You can have a Roth component within a 401k as well as your IRA. The Roth, simply put, you pay taxes today based on your current tax bracket, but you do not pay taxes on the amount that you withdraw in the future. So this is normally a uh, for those, uh, take they are taking advantage of the Roth IRA for those that want to grow the retirement account without the tax burden uh, when they start to disperse or when they start to withdraw their tax or their, excuse me, their investment account. So those are the two primary tax stru uh, structures. And there are many, many different other ways that you can go about utilizing and, 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 and leveraging and, and everything with your retirement accounts. You need to talk to a qualified CPA about those and different ways that you can approach that. But these are the most common, a traditional component and then a Roth component, okay? Now, the investment options are this, and most, uh, what are these going to be are your custodians or your plan sponsors? Many of these you will know, you're going to recognize. So whether you work for an employer or maybe you've got your own individual retirement account, your IRA, if you have them hosted at one of these companies, uh, by and large, they're normally going to be offering you products in the stock market, whether it's insurance policy, whether it's blue chip stocks, whether it's mutual funds, no matter what, they're offering you products that are found within the stock market. Now, some of these uh, brokerages, some of these uh, custodians or plan sponsors, they may say, well, this is a self-directed plan. We, we allow you to self-direct your investment. All I would say is that if you have a brokerage or one of these companies that is managing or uh, one of the many, many other uh, custodian or plan sponsor companies out there, simply ask them, can I invest my retirement into a rental property? Or can I buy gold or silver with my retirement account? Can I invest in my uh, and my best friend's lawn care business and he's trying to grow. 
If they say no, then your plan truly is not self-directed. It's only self-directed, in quotes, because they are giving you options and you get to choose. But at the end of the day, these companies actually put together those options and they determine what you can and cannot invest in. And the only way that those companies make money is by investing in the stock market. So of course, all of their options to you are going to be in the stock market. So let's really dive into what does the government say about re uh, investing for your retirement? So in 1974, the ERISA, was uh, was passed into law, and it stands for Employee Retirement Income Act. Now, it, according to the ERISA, this over this, this basically gave out the guidelines for individuals as they and companies anybody that is investing into retirement accounts what can and cannot be held inside a retirement account. Now, there are literally only two uh, two asset categories that cannot be held inside of a retirement account. One of those is collectibles and the other is life insurance. As far as collectibles go, uh, baseball cards, art, antiques, uh, gym, uh, even alcoholic drinks are considered collectibles. So anything that's collectible that you, people collect and then sell for hopefully future because of appreciation and, and the general public demand of those items, uh, you cannot hold in a, in a retirement account. Now, that being said, uh, coins, uh, are considered a, a prohibited category unless it is a precious metal coin. So if you want to really dive into that, you can go into the IRC, that's the Internal Revenue Code Section 408, uh, Section M or Subsection M, and you can really dive into what makes a precious metal coin, uh, whether it fits within that collectible category or whether it does not. Also, uh, if you do have an IRA, uh, specifically a self-directed IRA or some other type of retirement account that allows you to invest in uh, precious metals, consult with your custodian to make sure that you are not violating uh, the ERISA. Also, there are prohibited transactions and disqualified persons. You can find out more about that by reading here at the irs.gov website. I've left it up here, so if you're writing it down, please do so. Uh, you can go there and read it out more. Uh, read about that more concerning what is considered a prohibited transaction and a disqualified person. Now, in January of 2020, the Secure Act was passed. Now, what is the Secure Act? Well, it made some changes to, in addition, some uh, some additional. Uh, requirements to the ERISA. So the SECURE Act uh, increased your required minimum distribution, the RMD, it increased that from 70, 70 and a half to 72. So what that means now is once you reach, uh, let's say in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2019, if you retired in 2019, uh, if you or if you reached the age of 70 and a half, even if you had a job, even if you didn't need the money, you were required by law to start taking distributions from your retirement account. And of course, if you had a job and now you're taking distributions from your retirement account, it could increase your taxable, uh, your tax income bracket. And that could, of course, throw everything off. So what Congress did, they passed uh, the required minimum distribution to the age of 72. Also, the traditional IRA contribution can now be made past 70 and a half as well. So you can continue to contribute to a traditional component of the IRA past the age of 70 and a half. You can continue to contribute to qualified charitable uh, contributions. Your QCDs can also be made after 70 and a half. And there are several other uh, issues or plans, uh, excuse me, adjustments that were made during the SECURE Act. Uh, inherited accounts, what you can and cannot do with inherited accounts. Uh, being able to withdraw your retirement to pay for birth or adoption. Uh, as well as the 529 ED plans, you can actually withdraw the 529 ED plans to pay for your college, uh, college debt. So all of these can be discussed more with a qualified CPA that understands these changes and how it can help and, and they can help you structure that. Or you can, of course, discuss with your custodian. Now, here's a question. Is more control, is it possible? Is there a way to have more control over your retirement accounts? We've looked at the custodians and the different ways that these big brokerages basically control your investments. Is there a way for you to have more control? Well, I believe there is. And what we're going to look at two components that give you, the, the individual investor, a lot more control and ability to 
manage your retirement accounts better than maybe what you feel is being managed right now. So the first we're going to discuss is a solo 401k. The other is called a self-directed IRA. Now, the self-directed IRA is basically an IRA with a custodian that allows you to invest in all the different options that are out there, not just what the custodian has. So first we're gonna cover the IRA. So there are more options. This goes for the IRA, but it also goes for the 401k. You can invest in commercial real estate, single family residences. You can invest in notes secured real estate. You can invest in bullion, an idea, a startup. You could invest in an existing business or a friend's business. You can even invest in the stock market, no matter what, all of these options and many, many more are available to you when you have a truly self-directed IRA or an SD IRA. And there are specific custodians that will allow you to invest to self-direct the custodian where to invest your money instead of only what the custodian offers, which is typically the stock market. As far as a 401k, a 401k needs a plan sponsor, just like your employer has a plan sponsor, typically one of those large companies. Well, if you have your own company, your company can have a solo 401k plan. It needs a plan sponsor. I personally use Sense Financial. This is a great company, tons of educational uh, material and information, as well as the owner of the company, Dimitri. He's extremely personable, will jump on a call, will answer any questions you have, I personally highly, highly recommend that you reach out to Sense Financial if you're considering opening up a solo 401k for your company. As far as self-directed IRA, there are a whole list of custodians. We actually have a list of custodians, as well as a question form that you can sit down and ask each self-directed IRA custodian so that you can make the best decision for yourself. As well, uh, if you go to biggerpockets.com, here's the link. You can go there and they have a very comprehensive list of self-directed IRAs. And you can, of course, use that list along with our form and then find the self-directed IRA that best works with your needs and where you're located. So let's take a look at some examples of a 401k and an IRA. And then we're going to dive into the self-directed 401 or self-directed IRA and solo 401k specifically. So Lisa is going to be our example for the rest of the time that we're doing the presentation. And Lisa has a 401k and an IRA. So in 2020 and 2021, there are annual contribution limits to each of these. This means this is the most that Lisa could invest in either one of these retirement accounts. And for a 401k, Lisa can contribute up to 19500 In her IRA, she can contribute up to 6000 Yes, Lisa, you can actually have each of those. You can have a 401k and you can have an IRA. Matter of fact, you could have multiple IRAs. However, the maximum annual contribution, no matter if you have one IRA or 100 IRAs, is $6,000. So just be aware, whether you have one or many, you can only contribute a maximum of 6,000 across all of the IRAs that you have. Of same with the 401k, that is your annual maximum contribution, no matter how many 401ks you have, whether you've got one with an existing employer and a past employer, no matter what. So just understand that those are your uh, limits for 20 and 21. Now, if you are over the age of 50, this is a carve out within the law. So if you're 50 years or older, so from 50 all the way up to 72, based on January 2020, uh, you have the ability to actually contribute what's called catch-up limits. So this is what it looks like for a 401k and an IRA. So this means if you're 50 years old or older, all the way up to 72, you can contribute $6,500 to a, in addition to your $19,500 to a 401k, and you can contribute an additional $1,000 to your IRA. So what does that look like in total? So if you're 50 years or older, your total contribution limits look like this. For your 401k, it's $26,000 and your IRA is $7,000. So let's look over a 401k example. So Lisa works for an employer. This is a large company, let's say. And this company provides a 401k that Lisa can invest in for her retirement. Now, many people choose, if there is a 401k offered by their company, they really invest as much as they can in the 401k because of this one key component besides the amount that they can invest. But this is really powerful. Most employers 
allow what's called a matching contribution. The average is about 5%. I've seen them as low as 1%, and I've seen them as high as 7 to 8%. I think there might be one or two companies out there that do a 10% matching contribution, but by and large, the average is right around 5%. So that means if Lisa maxes out her annual contribution to her 401k, 19,500, based on a 5% average, the company would uh, contribute 975. And this, of course, would mean that the total amount that is now into Lisa's retirement account is 20,475. Not bad, right? Um, again, you need to look at your employer's plan. The plan that is put together by your employer is going to lay out exactly what those are. Sometimes there's hurdles. Maybe uh, the max, uh, uh, the excuse me, mac matching contribution may start off at 1% and maybe it goes up or maybe it starts off at a high percent and then it goes down. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that they structure those. So be sure that you're reading and understanding what that looks like. What does this look like if Lisa's over 50? Remember, she gets to have that additional contribution of you know, $6,000 if it's over. Uh, she's 50 years or older. So now what does that look like? Well, based on that, the contribution limit has now increased to 26,475. That's not bad. What if there was a better way? What if there was a way that you could could significantly increase double the amount that Lisa is able to contribute? Well, I'm going to show you how. Introducing the solo 401k. So in this regard, Lisa or you would actually need to have your own company that is being profitable. So in this case, Lisa has a consulting firm. So Lisa's created Consulting Lisa, and Consulting Lisa decides as the company to create a plan. So Consulting Lisa has a 401k or a solo 401k for its employees. Lisa happens to be the only employee, therefore the solo component. What makes this so powerful is that, of course, Lisa is able to contribute her 19500 but her company can create the plan. And if you're working with the right type of plan sponsor, you can get what's called a 100% matching contribution. Yes, you can go up to 100% matching contribution from your company. So that means whatever Lisa invests into her solo 401k, the company will match that up to 19500 because, of course, that's her individual uh, annual maximum right there. So that means for 2020 and 21 and on, her, she could actually contribute $39,000 to her 401k, herself and her company. That's really powerful. And on top of that, she has complete control over where that retirement account invests in. She can invest in whatever she wants. Now, if Lisa is over the age of 50, what does that look like? Remember, you get to contribute that catch-up amount of $6,000. However, the solo 401k cannot match the catch-up amount. It can only match the primary contribution. So with that being said, all things considered, everything gets matched and she's able to contribute 45,000. We're getting really close to doubling our contribution. But right now that's that's it. That's all you you cannot finagle this anymore, can you? Well, there is a way. It's called a PSP. What is a PSP? Well, it's a profit sharing plan. So Lisa's company can, when she creates, the company creates the plan that Lisa as the employee invests in, they can have an addendum, and for lack of a better word, to that plan where it is a profit sharing plan, meaning that the company will match up to 25% or it will contribute up to 25% of the company's profits with an annual maximum of 37,500. That's pretty cool. So now Lisa contributes her 19,500 and because her company's done really well, it, it's able to contribute that 37,500, which means her bringing her annual contribution to 57,000 to her plan. Now the 2020 maximum contribution amount is actually 63,500. Well, how is that possible? If Lisa is over the age of 50, Remember, she's able to then contribute her $60,000. And when all things considered, 
are added together, that gets you that magical number, 63,500. Technically, uh, the, her, her contribution amount is actually only 63,000. Uh, that's interesting because the the maximum contrib- uh, contribution for a PSP is, n- is not more than 37,500, but the uh, personal contribution for her is 19,500 and then 6,000. <clears> it actually works out to be 63 even. Uh, so, there's a 500 discrepancy somewhere in there. The IRS didn't, I think, uh, fully think that out. But the 2020 maximum contribution limit is 63500 If you remember at the beginning of this presentation, you as an em- employee and an investor, you can actually have both a solo 401k and a self-directed IRA. So you've got your own company. Let's just say Lisa's consulting. She's doing very well in her company. And her company is able to, because it's structured as a profit sharing plan, by the way, the profit sharing plan, the maximum uh, amount can be 25%. So uh, it can be less than 25%, but the most it can be is 25%. So if Lisa is able to max all of these out and she is 49 years or younger, uh, then this is what, excuse me, this is what her total contributions for 2020 and moving on 57,000 inside her solo 401k and 6,000 inside her self-directed IRA. If she is over the age of 50, remember she is able to have catch-ups not only on her solo 401k, but also with her self-directed IRA. So that means if she maxes contributions to both of those, as well as her company contributes through the PSP, there is her total maximum contribution. That is 70,500 every year that could be going into her total retirement package. And remember, everyone, inside the solo 401k and the self-directed IRA, Lisa has complete discretionary say over where that self-directed IRA invests him. As long as she's not violating uh, you know, prohibited transactions or disqualified persons, her custodian will allow her to invest in pretty much anything except for those two uh, excluded categories. And same with her solo 401k. And remember, because she is the owner of her company, her, she can determine on behalf of her company where the 401k invest. So extremely powerful. Uh, this just completely can open up a whole new world for opportunities and possibilities for you as an investor as you're building your retirement account. Now, I told you earlier, I wanted to introduce to you Sense Financial. Huge fan of Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri's not paying me anything. I don't get any kickbacks or anything like this uh, for this information. I firmly believe in the company. I believe in the product that he's put together and more so his generosity when it comes to information and sharing with people and helping people understand uh, what they can and cannot do within a 401k. So here's Dimitri's contact, his website. He's very active on LinkedIn and Facebook. That's his office phone number and of course, the email. So if you want to reach out to Dimitri, please do so. He'll definitely take 30 minutes out of his day, sit down with you, and he can discuss and walk you through the entire process for a solo 401k. They also do self-directed IRAs as well. Please reach out to Dimitri. Let him know that Edwin Epperson sent you, and I'm sure he will be able to connect you up and get you set up as quick as possible so that you can start taking more control of your retirement and your investment decisions. One of the things that I do within the sophisticated investor is teach people how to become a private lender. Now, there are two ways that you can become a private lender. You can be an active uh, private lender, which many of you know are like brokers, hard money lenders, or you can be a passive investor. For many of those people that I teach, time is huge, so they really want to to maximize the freedom of time, being a passive investor will do that for them. There's no experience required when you play on the passive investor side with private lending. I teach people and show people how to do that with no experience at all. This is what I call file cabinet money. Uh, You know, rentals are known as mailbox money. With private lending, you don't even have to leave the house (laughs) to go out to your mailbox to get the money. This literally shows up in your file cabinet every month. So I teach and show people how to become a private lender and get that file cabinet money. There is the ability to truly utilize leverage. True leverage does not mean just leveraging money, but it means leveraging other people's time, knowledge, and experience. And I teach people how to do that within the sophisticated investor, as well as participating and diversifying. There's nothing more powerful than knowing that you are participating with other sophisticated investors. And by doing so, you're able to diversify your portfolio 
you're able to diversify your investments across many different loans and across many different opportunities. Again, my name is Edwin Epperson. Thank you for joining me. This has been Retirement Investing with 401ks and IRAs. I am helping investors like yourself build, protect, and preserve your family's generational wealth. Please reach out to us, like us, and follow us on Facebook. You can, uh, of course, reach out to me. And if there's something, uh, educational topic that you'd like me to go over or present on, please let me know. And if you have experience, or uh, if you've got the knowledge over a specific thing, uh, please let's, let's connect. We can do a live co-hosted event and uh, we can get your information out to the public as well. So thank you so much. God bless and make it a great rest of your week.